it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. My best friend as a child was a mythological creature. <laughs> You'd have a better chance of seeing Jesus Christ, little brother, Jimmy, my older brother, exclaimed, when I told him what I'd seen. No, I really saw one. I talked to it too, I said, attempting one last word. Jimmy rolled his eyes at me and started his pickup truck. Gavin, you were sick. You had drugs pumping through you. The only thing you saw was an hallucination. <laughs> Chuckled. Half human creatures, my ass. Oh, just get us to work on time. Look, I don't need any shit from Bill. I said, changing the subject. He tried to fire Elma last week. Yeah, I know. Look, hold my coffee while I back this old girl up. Something sparked the memory earlier that morning on our way into work at the local brewery. I was in a local Dunkin' Donuts when I saw a woman in a wheelchair who dropped a pendant. I picked it up and, upon handing it to her, realized I'd seen it somewhere else. Well, she was gone before I could catch up to her. There was something about her that, well, I felt like I recognized. The pendant was unusual because it was a trident that, well, a sea god like Neptune would use, and made from aquamarine. My well, eyes shut up. I don't know why I brought up stuff like that to Jimmy. Should have known because my brother's belief in anything supernatural, spiritual or weird made him laugh or list all the reasons people like me, a believer, should be skeptical. He didn't have to believe me, and that was fine. But I knew what I'd seen all those years ago as a sick little boy. Well, I'd been in and out of hospitals as a kid. They couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. All they knew was that I had no immune system body stopped fighting off infections until I was admitted to St. Thomas Hospital. After I was in St. Thomas for over a month, all of my symptoms mysteriously disappeared. It was part of my experiences there. I had so many, but, well, one stood out more than all the others. I met her, or it, or whatever you want to call her. She told me her name was Gail, with the big, starry aquamarine eyes. So I guess that's what I'll call her now, as I tell you my story, and you don't have to believe it. She said her name was Gail, but I just call her my friend. I was throwing up in a bucket the nurse had provided me with when she arrived. The nurse gently stroked my back, trying to comfort me, and I had to be no more than eight or nine at the time. I think the nurse took pity on me because I was alone now. My parents were no longer allowed to visit me. Well, the doctors were afraid that they could compromise my immune system further, so every precaution was taken to keep me out of danger. Martha, can you assist me when you've finished with Gavin? said one of the other nurses. Martha, my primary caretaker, nodded, cleaned me up, and then proceeded to lay me back down as she moved into the hallway. She began to help the other nurse push one of the beds towards a room at the very end of my floor. They left my door wide open, so I could now see and hear everything all around me. Well, I couldn't see the patient, but as they wheeled her by, I heard one of the nurses mention she didn't have normal legs. Oh, very sad, isn't it? One of them was saying to Martha. Mm, indeed. What happened to her? Another voice said. Oh, no one knows. The parents? Martha asked. <sighs> Monsters, said another voice. Oh, like shredded meat, said another voice. This time it was closer to my door. I recognized it as my doctor. The older man was kind but stern. Then he peeked in at me and quietly shut my door. Oh, we've seen worse, ladies. Let's get back to the work we're here to do. He shut my door and I fell into a deep sleep. The next morning I was awoken by the sound of something hitting my floor like a wet mop being slapped repeatedly on the tile floor on my hospital room. I couldn't see what it was, but there was light coming from the hallway. I laid there as I heard it coming closer, when it got just below the part of the bed closet to where my head was. I saw them. Eyes popped up from underneath my bed. They seemed to glow brightly like dark black and blue crystals. 
The shape of the head was like that of a little girl, no more than my age, eight or nine. Her hair was tattered, long and black. Her mouth seemed to open wide as her eyes grew larger and blacker. Her teeth were sharp as they appeared from nowhere, and then her tongue fell from her lips in an elongated slurp. I couldn't fight, nor did I resist as fear kept me firmly in place. My mouth was dry and my breath went in quick heaves of shock. I felt a sharp sting before I saw it. Her tongue latched onto my neck first, and I saw what appeared to be a tentacle, not unlike an octopus, wrapping its way around my entire body, immobilizing every possible movement. This being held me into place as her sharp tongue held firm, sucking up my neck. Then I noticed the door to the room open further still, and the creature stopped immediately. It disappeared quickly, as Martha was coming in to check on me. She smiled until she saw the blood coming from my neck. Oh, what on earth? She immediately inspected my entire body for other marks. When Martha realized that there were no other cuts or scratches on me, she resigned to the fact I must have scratched myself in my sleep. Martha smiled, looking at me with a rather strange look in her eyes and then went to retrieve a large medicine cabinet on wheels with numerous items inside it. She cleaned my wound and placed a bandage on it. Martha had her back to the door, and I saw a shadow squirm quickly from the room and towards the end of the hall. Well, it happened so fast that I questioned if I'd seen it at all. The only proof I had were the sharp markings in my neck, oh, that and a blue gob on the floor. Martha stood up, and she saw it. What on earth is that? She turned on the light closest to the door to my hospital room, inspected it, and then shrugged. Looks like ink, hmm, she said to herself before turning to me. I'll send someone to clean it. Hey, do you need anything else? I shook my head, still wondering what on earth had happened. When things were quiet, I got up from my bed and decided to take a walk. I never left my room except for when the doctors took me to run tests, but my curiosity about what that thing was had gotten the better of me. I knew the creature was the little girl with no legs at the end of my floor. I recall being petrified as I walked towards her room. Nurses smiled as they passed me in the hall. Getting some exercise, Gavin? asked one of the new nurses. Two new nurses started the day she arrived. They were tall and pretty and always seemed to be around. I faked a smile as she passed me, and there was something off about her gaze. I turned my attention to the room of the newest patient on my floor. I smelled the room before I even got to the door. It smelled odd, like salt water and lavender. Oh, I couldn't explain it. I didn't even knock. I just quietly opened the door to her room. What I found was not what I expected. In my mind's eye, I kept seeing that creature that had bitten me with her tongue. What I found was a little girl hooked up to IVs, machines I didn't recognize, and I felt terrible for thinking she was what I'd seen in my room. Maybe I was mistaken, but yeah, that had to be the reason. I looked around and noticed a name written on the whiteboard behind me. Gail. Date of birth, unknown. I turned to leave when... I saw her open her eyes. Well, there was no mistaking her dark eyes. I just stood there in curious bewilderment more than any other reason. I was frozen in place by my necessity to learn more about what had happened to me. She began to sit up, and as she did, her gaze never wavered. I took a deep breath. She put her left index finger up to her lips and made a shh motion. I knew then she was asking me not to tell anyone what had happened. I nodded and, for whatever reason, I was no longer afraid of her. I crept closer to her, as though I were afraid she might disappear from my presence. I reached out my hand to touch her. She never flinched, and she never moved. She only blinked those black blue eyes as she looked into mine. Hi, my name's Gavin, I found myself saying. She smiled a little and held out her hand, 
still saying nothing. Her hand was clammy, and yet all at once I felt drawn to her. I instinctively knew she wasn't trying to eat me that morning. She told me, later on, she had to taste me to ensure I was safe to be around because she felt immediately drawn to me that morning when they passed my room with her hospital bed. And from that moment on, I barely left her side. I learned that her name was Gail because a good Samaritan brought her into the hospital after finding her lifeless body on the beach, as if she'd been washed up on the shoreline. The only thing identifying her was a necklace that had the name Gail on it. There was no record of where she'd come from because there was well, no birth, dental or fingerprint records. Gail wasn't enrolled in any of the nearby schools, and she was thought to have been cut up purposely. Whoever had hurt Gail had to be a monster. What parent was not looking out for this wayward child? It had to be the parents because no one came looking for her, and she had markings as though it was a punishment gone overboard. Uh, I didn't want to think about something so terrifying. I never relayed any of the things to Gail that I heard the hospital staff discuss when they thought I was out of ear range. I knew it was most likely none of those things. Though. Gail had come from a far-off place beyond our comprehension, a place beyond our ocean. She was, in fact, a mythical creature. I was confident she was a Cecilia, half human, half octopus, and a daughter of Neptune. Although Gail and I had grown close during our stay, I'd never asked her how she ended up here. Gail couldn't talk. It was as if she were never given a voice. I did find that she could write very fast and legibly, so Martha provided her a large notebook and coloured pencil. Instead of spending hours chatting, I taught her games, and we played checkers after I showed her how. Well, I managed to teach her other games, like an old maiden. She enjoyed it, but once I taught her, she always managed to beat me very quickly. I did eventually ask her how she ended up here one afternoon, when we had our weekly Saturday movie day. Martha had set us up in our own special viewing room. Most of the other kids were okay and could be around one another. But Gail and I, well, we were special. We both could be around each other because, even with my immune system issues, Gail didn't affect me. Gail had no legs, and hospital staff worried the other children would say something offensive, as Gail had been through so much. She got around in a wheelchair, and because I was so weak, we spent many hours in our wheelchairs together. And so, we were best friends, and Martha ensured we were comfortable. So... Today, children, the movie is going to be The Little Mermaid, Martha said, putting the DVD in the player. Gail smiled at me, and I sat back, ready to watch the movie as it began. The mermaids appeared on screen shortly after, singing, and Gail began to scream and cry. She began to change before my very eyes. Gail's eyes grew black, and the veins popped out of her face, as though they had a life of their own where her legs typically were not, now had tentacles growing out of the lower half of her body. I sat back in my chair, too afraid to move. The singing in the movie ceased as a massive tentacle appeared from behind Gail and smashed the television. Tears welled up inside Gail's dark eyes. I found myself going to her, regardless of any fear I felt at viewing her monstrous outrage. I slipped my small hand into hers, and held on to it as she calmed down. What happened to you? I asked her. Finally, as though the water broke in my tiny brain, she showed me with her mind. Merman creatures had done this, murdered her entire family in a bloodlust like I'd never imagined could exist. They came in the night when Gail and her fellow creatures would be sleeping. They came with human men in boats too, Large ships with government markings on them. They blew them out of their caves. The mermen disemboweled their prey using their teeth, some of them eating their flesh while they were still alive in a bloody display of dominance. The mer people were like hired hitmen for the men in their boats. They slaughtered the octopus people, and the men in boats collected their bodies in giant hooks. The brutality was shocking and I felt my body growing colder as I held onto her hand. There were so many of them, and 
In the centre rose an enormous creature bigger than all of them. It began with waves under the sand, like a great earthquake. Black tentacles burrowed into the bottom of the ocean floor, and the ripples it caused frightened the mer people as a great source of fire erupted from the ground. The black shadow excreted a dark substance that shot out from its centre and blackened everything to where nothing could be seen. The only thing you could make out were the silver eyes that rushed through the water. Piercing screams shattered the glass and metal of the sunken ships. I had the feeling that this creature had been the creator of everything under the sea. It rose and used its power to scorch the bottom of the ocean floor until it broke apart. It created fiery veins like liquid lava churning up and out of the seabed and decimating everything around and burning their flesh like an atom bomb. Oh, the screaming never ceased. Some of the boats, however, managed to escape the creature's revenge. I could only gather that this was apparent to them all. The grief was felt in the final act of murderous revenge. It was too late for the Cecilia tribes of men and women, though. They were dead, and pieces of them lay on the bottom of the ocean floor. Gail had escaped to the surface layer of water among bouncing sea caps and in the process, her tentacles were ripped from her body by her own doing as a form of molting. She had no choice but to look as human as possible and escape to the shore. It wasn't known why the men in the government ships wanted the Cecilia people, but my guess was they had something they wanted. I was sickened by what I'd seen my fellow human beings do to Gale's family, but most of all I was shocked that mermaids existed, even more that they were hideous underwater vampires that thirsted on other half-human, half-animal creatures like themselves. Gale released her hand from mine. My tears now reflected hers. And Gale's tentacles disappeared as rapidly as they'd appeared, as Gale shed them from her body. They fell to the floor of the movie room as they crumbled into dust. So, that's how she'd done it before, I thought. She was lucky because Martha came in then. Martha always seemed to be nearby. What happened? she asked. Oh, um, Gail accidentally fell off a wheelchair. I'm sorry, it was an accident. I lied. Martha just looked at both of us for a long moment and shook her head. And then we helped Gail back to her room. Gail was less active for the next few days, as if she'd become depressed. There was something older about her now, and I didn't know why, but it felt like it was something I had done. I thought back to how Gail showed me the massacre of her family and, and how painful it had been for her to show me. Part of me wondered if she'd left herself on that beach in human form to escape the sea and all of the creatures that may do her harm with it. Well, I tried, unsuccessfully, for the last few days to get Gail to come and hang out with me. She'd grown lethargic and disinterested in me and my games. And then something happened that changed everything once and for all. Two nights later, I woke to the sound of someone screaming. I sat up in bed, nearly knocking over my food tray. Well, I knew instantly it was Gail, and she was in danger. I ran as best I could in my condition, and when I got into Gail's room, two of the nurses were holding her down. One of them held a needle in her hand, and the other turned to look at me. Sheer hatred for me illuminated in that nurse's eyes. What had I walked into? Go back to your room, said the karma of the nurses when she turned around, and I realized it was Martha. I looked at them both, confused, as Martha came over to me, putting her hand on my shoulder, looking deeply into my eyes, almost hypnotizingly and spoke gently. Everything's going to be all right. Just go back to your room, Gavin. I nodded up at her, but when I looked down at her arms, I noticed they looked off. Her skin was scaly like a fish. It poked out from her sleeve, and it was almost silvery blue. Her hypnotic gaze no longer controlled me. I knew what she was, and why she'd come. I didn't even consider I might be in danger. I ran from Martha as she tried to hold me with her gaze and pushed the other nurse down to the ground. They were imposters, just posing as nurses. 
They were evil mermaids in disguise. Gail rose from the bed and suddenly her tentacles sprung from her body. They knocked the mermaids down and with one touch of her tentacles, they cowered as though it burnt them. They scattered out the door as I heard one of them say, He will come for us all. Who was he? I wondered to myself as I approached Gail. I shivered then, thinking about that creature I'd seen in Gail's mind when she showed me what had happened the day her people were murdered. She was shaking and hugged me tightly. Well, I wasn't surprised that Martha went MIA after the events of that night. She must have figured out what Gail was when she studied my bite marks and the way Gail had washed up on shore. And then, another odd thing happened. The St. Thomas Hospital caught on fire. There was an evacuation, and I recall being very nervous about my friend, Gail, the Sicilian. It was only a false alarm, brought on by the kitchen cook burning bread in the oven. Uh, all the patients were accounted for after, and we were able to return to our rooms. All except one. Gail. Well, there was a frantic search for her, but she was not found. A missing person alert went out on her, but to no avail. Gail, it seemed, was gone for good. Well, I cried myself to sleep when it was declared she hadn't been found and most likely never would be. A week later, I had a visitor. A man came into my room. One of the other nurses introduced him as Detective Pete Nunn. His eyes were the same sort of dark blue as Gail's. His hair was whitish grey and his chiseled cheekbones made him look like an older male model. He wore a dark blue suit with silk pockets to match, and next to his name was a trident symbol. Hello, I'm Detective Nunn, and I'm only here to ask you a few questions, if I may. He smiled warmly, and I trusted him instantly. Okay, I said politely. When was the last time you saw the nurse, Martha? A week ago, Martha was giving my friend Gail a shot to calm her down. Mm, I see. Was she with anyone else? Yeah, a mean nurse. Well, what did the mean nurse look like? He asked as though he knew what I was going to say. She was tall and had long hair. She was really pretty. Okay, and uh, you haven't seen your nurse, Martha, at all since then? I shook my head. No. All right. Thank you, young man, he said, standing up. He came over to me and shook my hand. When he held it, I felt differently and better than I had in a long time. <laughs> I just couldn't explain it. He stood by the door, and then he stopped before he left. She's with us now. Thanks to your help, she's safe. And then he left me in the bed, and I looked around, trying to grasp what had just happened. Within a few days, I was magically cleared to go home to my family. I gradually grew up and moved on from that experience. It wasn't until this morning when I met the woman at the local Dunkin' Donuts that I recalled Gail. I never knew why those government officials and mermaids wanted her and her kind dead. Maybe I will never know. Honestly, I don't want to know. Well, I like to think that I had indeed saved a life that day when I attacked the nurses so that Gail could fight back. I held the pendant in my hand, thinking about Gail and wondering if she was back at sea. As I was wondering this, I looked up from my position in the passenger seat of my older brother's truck. We'd come upon the road just near the shoreline when I happened to look up at the sky. If I hadn't known any better, I could have sworn that there were clouds of black, shaped like massive tentacles hitting the sea from a distance. Later that night, I popped open a beer and sat in my recliner. It had been 30 years or so since I'd last seen Gail. I wondered what she'd look like now, if she were alive. I finished another beer and then closed my eyes. It must have been an hour later when I felt a strange sensation engulf my body. I woke to find that a giant tentacle was wrapped around my body. I began to scream. But before I could let anything out from my mouth, I saw her peek up over the recliner. She was taller and slim, like a model. 
Her eyes were large, but this time they fit her head. Her dark hair was longer than it had been thirty years ago. <laughs> Gail, I said, feeling a glimmering of tears rising in my eyes. Gail smiled down at me and put her left index finger to her mouth and whispered, Shh. My wife vanished in the house on Emerson Street. I think I was about four or five when we moved to Ohio from California with my dad after my parents divorced. My dad bought an old colonial home near Kent, Ohio on a street called Emerson. As I recall, I always sort of felt creeped out by that house. It wasn't anything I could put my finger on but it was strange just the same. Sometimes you could hear sounds coming from the places in the house that didn't make sense, or broken voices, or, sometimes, pounding on my bedroom walls. My dad said it was the house settling, and that it was all in my head. <sighs> yeah, you've heard it all before, blah, blah, blah. Anyhow, round about the time I was 21, my father died and left the house to me in his will. Not long after that, I got engaged and my fiancée moved in with me. Now, I said it was a strange house, but to this day I have no idea how to describe what happened to me there. My now wife, Sandy, and I were newlyweds and she was between jobs, so she was home alone a lot. She wasn't the skittish type or anything like that. She liked being alone so she could work on her macrame projects. I should mention it was the late 1970s then, so it wasn't unusual for one person in the home to stay at home and the other to go out at work. One afternoon, something happened that I'd all but forgotten about until later, but I'd gotten a strange call from Sandy while I was at work. I was typing up reports for my boss and slowly trying to move up the corporate ladder when I got a call from my wife. Jerry, I need you to come home. Is everything all right? I queried. No, I mean, oh, I don't know. Just get home as fast as you can. Now, being that Sandy was a sort of non-hysterical woman and more of a realist, I figured it must be very serious. I looked at my watch and realized it was near quitting time anyway. So I made the excuse that I had a headache and left for the remaining part of the day. When I got home, my wife was drinking a glass of wine, which was unusual for her so early in the day. I took one look at her sitting on the stairs and I stopped dead. What happened? I don't even know what to say. Well, damn it, Sandy. I left work early. Tell me what the hell happened. By now, I was starting to get annoyed. Jerry, I need you to listen to me. And please, whatever you do, don't make fun of me. Hmm, this was going to be good, I told myself. I was in the laundry room in the basement this afternoon, just hanging up some clothes to dry. Well, I walked over to the other side from where I was standing. And... Oh, I don't even know how to describe it. Mm, okay. I looked at her puzzled, wondering where this was going. I wasn't in the basement anymore. I was like in the woods, and there were these people around me. They looked so scary. One had a painted face like a Native American or something, and the other one was bloody, and his face... Oh, my God, Jerry, his face. By now she'd started crying into her wine and had lit a cigarette. I took a deep breath. I sat down next to her on the stairs and put my hand on her shoulder. I think that maybe we need to get you some rest. She agreed and I took her into the house and put her to bed. I figured maybe she'd just seen one too many stories in the news lately about wars and such. Too much alone time can spark the wilds of the imagination, after all. 
That following day, I was working at my desk and got another phone call. It was Sandy, but she was calling my name. Jerry, Jerry, can you hear me? Jerry, are you there? Honey, we must have a bad connection or something. I'll be home in 30 minutes. I thought it was strange, but thought no more of it because it was a Friday, and I was glad to be getting off early and going home to enjoy the summer weather. Later that day, I was in the yard, and Sandy came out with a glass of lemonade. She seemed okay and no longer seemed to be worried about the incident from the day before. Whatever it was, it was now forgotten. We talked a while about the yard, and the fact she still wanted a little curb appeal. We planned to go to the garden centre in town later that day. Sandy and I then went in the house, and we prepared dinner. Shortly after dinner is when things got really strange. I was in the kitchen preparing some meat for the grill, when I saw Sandy go into the fridge and pull out some potatoes. As she was cutting them, she cut her finger on the knife she was using. Eeh, gotta be careful, hon, I said, looking at it. I know. I'll be right back. Gonna go and grab a band-aid. With that, she went to the bathroom that was just off the kitchen, and when I tell you I saw her go in, I saw her walk in. Shut the door. I even heard the sink running. After about 15 minutes, I started to get worried. I went to see if she was okay and knocked on the door. I opened it and... Nothing. But the sink was still running water and my wife was gone. There are no windows in the downstairs bathroom. It consists of a toilet and a sink with a little medicine cabinet that hangs below a little mirror. In other words, it isn't anything special. She didn't even shut the door all the way. Now, when I tell you she went in but didn't come out, I mean it. I have no idea where she went. I never saw her leave the bathroom, and I was facing the bathroom at the counter in the kitchen while I worked on seasoning my meats and cutting up the vegetables. I was facing the bathroom. I turned off the sink and quickly looked around. <laughs> Maybe I was going crazy or something. I looked around the house for her. I looked outside, too. Both cars were still in the driveway, and I yelled to my neighbor Bob across the street who was outside washing his car. He too hadn't seen Sandy. When I went back in, I realized that something felt off. One thing I knew, my wife had vanished into thin air. I started to freak out a bit. How could she just vanish? It was impossible by all accounts. This stuff just didn't happen in real life. I tried to remain as calm as I could, but an hour turned into two, and before I knew it, three days had passed. I was scared to death at this point. I'd reported her missing, and when the detective spoke to me, he basically looked at me like some sad sack whose wife had run off with some other guy. A few days turned into a week, then a week into a month, and then, before I knew it, I had lost track of time altogether. I'd basically stopped going into work, and I had to take medical leave because they figured out what the detective had, that my wife had left me, and I had a nervous breakdown. Finally, years passed by, and Sandy never came back. I'd finally moved on and met another woman by the name of Mary. Mary was really into the occult and stuff, and was always reading about New Age philosophies and such things. We weren't married, but after two years of dating, she moved in with me. I came home one afternoon from work, and I found a note from Mary that she'd gone to the store. To be honest, me coming home from work and not finding Mary there gave me that odd feeling I had when Sandy went missing. In the back of my mind, I was always afraid of what might happen to Mary 
if she was alone too long in that house. I had even been looking for a place to move so I could sell this house. Well, Mary did come home after a trip to the store, and we talked about my interest in buying a new place. There was just that odd feeling I had of guilt. What if Sandy came back? What if she came back and I was gone? It had been twelve years by this point, and Sandy was gone and I knew she would never come back. I loved Sandy, and I just couldn't forget her. I reluctantly moved on, and Mary and I rented out a unit for a new age shop, and we lived in the apartment just above it. Now, here is the strangest thing of all, as if the rest of this wasn't strange enough. When Mary and I put the house up for sale, I had no takers for another ten years. I tried switching realtors time and time again. They would bring people by to look at the house, but they were never interested. I ended up keeping the old house on Emerson Street. I used it as a storage unit, basically, and we continued to live in the apartment above Mary's shop. By now it had been twenty-two years since the event, and Mary and I still lived together. We never got married, nor did we have any children. We lived in a happy sort of take-it-as-it-is existence. Then, one day, I got a random phone call from a young man named Jason, asking if he could rent the house with his two buddies. He was in town to attend college at Kent State, and the house was close to the main campus. I ended up going ahead and renting the house to him. By now it was paid for, and Mary and I could use the money to save for a cruise we'd planned to be going on. I put my things in the attic of the old house and rented the two lower levels out. Overall, they seemed like good kids. But then I started getting the phone calls. One evening, not long after they'd moved in, Mary and I were lying in bed just about to fall asleep when the phone rang. Uh, hello? I answered groggily. Hi, this is Jason. I'm really sorry to bother you, but have you or your wife been here today? They didn't know Mary wasn't my wife, but I was too tired to correct them. Uh, no, why? Well, there was someone banging on the door from the basement, and it was going on for a while, and I thought maybe you were down there fixing something. I was thinking perhaps this kid was on drugs. <laughs> why would I not tell you I was there fixing something? No, neither of us were there today. Are you sure it wasn't just raccoons? I felt just like my dad then, turning abnormal things into everyday things. The kid sounded as confused as I was, but we let it go for the moment. Then, a few nights later, I got another frantic call from Jason. Oh, hello, Jason. Yeah, how can I help you? Sir, I don't know how to tell you this, but... I think you should know your wife has been calling us at weird times during the day and night on the phone. She always asks for you and I always tell her you don't live here. I just wanted you to know because I think she may need like the doctor or something. I hung up the phone and told Mary. She was as confused as me, but there was only one thought I had in the back of my mind. I tried not to think of Sandy. What if she was calling me? And yet, from where? And how? My twenty-year-old nightmare came to an end a few days later. I was at work and I got another call from Jason. He was frantic, and that he kept hearing weird knocks on the walls, and always from the downstairs bathroom. He was insistent on me coming over, so I left work and went to my old house to help my tenant. To say I was annoyed was an understatement. I walked up the front porch of the house and knocked. He came to the door immediately, opening it and frantically telling me about the odd goings-on that he had been experiencing. He was talking so fast, I had to ask him to slow down. 
What I gathered was that he would often hear a woman's voice yelling, and he would often hear other people pounding on the walls. I sat down and put my head in my hand. I'd often heard the knocking from the time I was a little boy. It was the same thing that had happened to me as a kid. I would hear pounding and discombobulated voices. I could never make out what they were saying, but it always sounded like someone in distress. Just then, I heard the same pounding, and Jason and I looked at each other in horror. There was no one at the house, as Jason had explained to me on the phone. So who was making all the pounding? My fear was maybe an intruder, but that was soon a fear I tossed aside as I began to shake with tremors I had never experienced before. The bathroom door began to shake, and the handle twisted hard and fast, like something unseen was on the other side of the door. I saw a strange glow of light from under the door, then slowly the handle began to turn. The door opened slowly, and there stood Sandy. She was unchanged by time and space. Her hair was up as it had been the day she walked into the bathroom to mend her bloodied finger. She had a band-aid on her finger, and she was smiling until she saw me. She stopped in her tracks and looked around the room. I could see the confusion on her face and it had to mirror my own. Sandy was unchanged since the day she had entered the bathroom. It was like she was frozen in time. Sandy, where were you? I asked, stepping forward, dying to touch her once more as I stood in awe. What's going on, Jerry? You look so tired. Is dinner almost done? I'm starving. Oh, who is this young man? Is he staying for dinner? Twenty-two years and Sandy didn't skip a beat. I knew I looked different, and so much had changed. Um, Sandy, I think we need to talk. I said, sitting her down in front of me at the kitchen table. I held her hand and I told her the story of her missing years. I wish I could say that everything went back to normal, but it didn't. Mary and I broke up and I moved into my own apartment. Sandy moved in with a relative and tried to piece those missing years back together. To say we were all living in some sort of shock was an understatement. I've tried to come to terms with this entire event. The only thing Sandy recalls is she went into the bathroom and then came out and everything was different. The only time she recalled talking to me was when she said she recalled calling me on the phone at work prior to my coming home the day we planned to have a barbecue. I wondered if those phone calls Jason kept receiving were somehow Sandy calling me from the past, like a time loop. I had no idea. It was like she was in another space or time in that old house on Emerson Street. I have one thought that still creeps me out. All those years as a kid, I would hear banging on the bedroom walls and voices. Who or what was still inside that house trying to escape? So a couple of stories for you this evening by K.B. Hurst, also known as Black Friday's Witch, a fantastic writer who I've been working with and been friends with for quite a while now. Um, you'll probably remember the Helltown experiments, and I'm very happy to say that we're turning that into an audiobook, which is currently in the progress of being recorded very slowly and haphazardly by me, but will be available soon enough, I hope. <laughs> A uh, great couple of stories there. Thoughts, feelings, anything else in the comment section below the video. And as ever, I'll do my best to reply to as many of them as I can. 
Now you all stay safe and be back again with me very soon, won't you? Yeah? Of course you will. Well, until the next time, my dear friends, very, very sweet dreams, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.